What is something you would say that you love? I love the earth. It's something we need to take care of and preserve. I love coffee. I would say that I really love football. Oh, so do you recycle? Yeah. Uh-huh. Coffee isn't coffee when there's milk added to it. It has to be black. Favorite team is probably the British Patriots. The, the New England Patriots? Well, hey church, fall is in the air. The New England Patriots are back on the field this weekend. And uh, all is good, obviously, all is right with the world. And uh, we are beginning a brand new message series together this weekend. It is called Christian Atheist. And uh, it's funny, you know, as we were getting closer to the series and starting to promote and share the title with you, we heard a lot of interesting reactions to this one. Uh, there was a lot of people who just said Christian Atheist, what is that? That doesn't sound very good. There were a lot of other people that we even heard saying, you know what, I've been, I've been wanting to invite a friend to come with me to Central, and I was going to invite somebody for this next series, my one, but I'm not so sure I'm going to do that anymore because I heard the title. I don't know what this thing is about. I'm a little bit scared. Even a leader who in the past week came to us and said, is it too late? Can we change the name of this one? And obviously the answer is no. <laughs> No, we cannot. Uh, sorry, but we got to call it what it is. A Christian atheist is someone who believes in God, and most people believe in God. Most people, even in our country still today, they, they believe in God. It's someone who believes in God, but they live like they don't. They might even make the claim. They might even say, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. But they live like God doesn't exist. They live as if his word holds no value or weight in their lives. They live almost more like an atheist would live, a Christian atheist. And there are many Christian atheists in our world and in our churches today. So to get us started, I want to begin with just one verse. Uh, it is in the book of Titus. Now, the Apostle Paul, who was a missionary, he went around preaching the gospel, he started many churches, he, he led many younger pastors, Titus was one of them, he writes to him in this letter and he says, Titus, there's a lot of people in our churches right now who are only filled with meaningless talk. Talk, 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 that's all they do, they can talk a good game, they they sound spiritual, they make all of these claims, but their life, their actions, their behavior does not match, does not line up with their words and their claims. And so about the church, Paul says here to, to Titus in Titus 1.16, he says about these people in the church, they claim to know God, I know God, I believe in God, but by their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Paul says about these people in the church, they claim to know God, but they live like they don't. That's, that's what I would call a Christian atheist. And so in this series, we are talking about people who believe in God, but they live like they don't. And let me tell you where we are going. Week one, it's a five-week series. Let me tell you where we're going right now. Uh, this weekend, we are talking about people who, by their words, through their actions, they would communicate, they would say, I believe in God, but I love the things of this world. And you're going to see that phrase, the things of this world, as we turn to a book. It's the same book we're going to turn to every single week. It is 1 John. And if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to grab your Bibles right now at both of our locations. We have them in the seats around you. But if you're a little bit more high-tech than that and you have a smartphone and the YouVersion Bible app on there, you can go on under events, search Central Church. We will pop up right there. All the scriptures we're going to use with all the versions, some of the points on the back of your worship guide. You've got an outline as well. 
well. I want this to be a series where we do this together. We're challenging one another. We're learning together. We're partnering together for something good and greater. Uh, First John, number one, let me help you out if you're turning to the book of John, the gospel of John. Don't don't go there. Uh, John, the disciple, writes another letter, a book. It's an account of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But 1 John is near the end of our Bibles, closer to Revelation. And John is writing a letter here to Christians, believers, churches that were in the city of Jerusalem. And he's writing to them, these churches and people, during a time when many people were leaving the church, walking away from the church, exiting, deserting. But they weren't just leaving the church. They were also leaving the teachings of Jesus. And so John writes to these people during this time. He begins here in 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. He writes, he says, We proclaim to you... The one who existed from the beginning. Right away he's talking about Christ. Whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one who is life itself was revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. And we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things to you so that you may fully share our joy. And I I love the way that John begins this letter because he's saying to all who are listening, including us right now, he says, we're not writing to you about something we merely just heard about. We're not writing to you about some, some idea that we had or hunch. We saw him. We, we could touch him, the scars in his hands and his feet with our own hands. John says, I, I was a disciple. I, I was there. I spent years following him. And we are writing these things to you now so that you can have, he says, fellowship with or a relationship with God the Father and Christ Jesus, God's Son. And he writes this way. He starts his letter off this way because back then and still today, many people were believing in the Father and yet denying the Son. You see, when Jesus walked this earth some 2,000 years ago, Jesus came, Jesus was was born, sent into a Jewish culture, a Jewish community, and it was highly religious. People were very religious. They absolutely believed in God. They knew the Scriptures. They studied the Scriptures. And because they did, they knew that one was coming. They knew there was going to be a Savior, a Messiah, and he was going to be born here and go to these places and teach these things and work these miracles. And then guess what? Jesus came, and he was born there, did those things, worked all of those miracles, and he looked at all of these people and he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one, he says. And then he invited all these people, everybody, follow me, he said. Don't just pray a little prayer. Don't just go to church most of the time. He said, I want you to follow me. But many of those people, most of those people, what do they do? They rejected him. They rejected him. Oh, they still believed in God, right? We're going to believe in God. We're just going to reject you. They believed in God, but yet they rejected the Son, Jesus, and his teachings. Church, if I can get across... One thing to you this weekend, maybe it will be this. There is a massive difference between believers and followers. There is a massive difference between the two. And every time I start talking to you as a, as a church about believers and followers, my wife Amanda, she is so passionate about this topic. And I think it's because she grew up in a church where you could do whatever you wanted to do, Monday through Friday. It was your life. Do whatever you want. 
It's your life. It's your business. Live whatever way you want to as long as on Sunday morning you show up and you dress up really, really, really nice. They called that good enough. They called that belief and called those people believers. Church, I am troubled, astounded by how many people are called believers today. We look at people all the time and we go, oh yeah, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're a believer. Well, how do we know? Is there any fruit? Is there any evidence in their behavior, their actions, their lifestyle? Well, no, but you know, they're a believer. They, they believe they're a believer. I sit down sometimes with people who have lost a loved one and I say, tell me about their life and I get a few little things and I say, tell me about their faith. And oh, you know, Pastor Dan, they, they believe, you know, the stuff that you you talk about, you talk about a lot of stuff. You just keep talking and talking. All the stuff that you talk about, you know, on the weekend, they, they believe those things. So many people are labeled believers. But here's a better question. Are you following Jesus? You know, most people back then and still today, even in our churches, are content to merely believe in God. But we reject his son and reject the teachings of Jesus. And understandably so. You think about the things that Jesus taught. It wasn't easy stuff. Jesus taught obedience over comfort. That doesn't feel good. I don't want to do this. It doesn't feel good. Jesus taught us that we should be faithful and obedient anyway. Jesus taught that we would place God's kingdom above and before our kingdom. What did he say? Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. And then all these things that you care so much about and chase will be added unto you. In our relationships, Jesus taught faithfulness and purity. In our finances, he taught proper management and stewardship. And give to God what belongs to God because it belongs to God. That's simple. Our neighbors, what did he say? Love your neighbor the way you love yourself. How'd you do with that this past week? We all did that, right? Right? <laughs> about our enemies. Jesus taught us we should pray for our enemies and bless those who persecute you. How'd, you. how'd you do with that this past week at work, right? Maybe not so good. The teachings of Jesus are not easy. We believe as so-called believers that following Jesus and following his teachings are going to lead to life. Church, it leads to eternal life. But that does not mean it's an easy road. It's an easy path to get there. And Christian atheists, (laughs) Christian atheists, they are content to believe in God, but the teachings of Jesus are just too restrictive and inconvenient. They become like, we become like children. Those of us who are parents and grandparents and we have children, we've got Rules. We give our kids rules to, to live by and follow and restrictions. And, you know, we, we say, this is the way I, I want you to live your life. We have boundaries for you. We have barriers for you. And especially the older they get. So I've been told i got little kids, you know. Praise God they're not teenagers yet, right? But, but when they get there and they get a taste of freedom, they start to resist and they start to reject and push back. And they go, this isn't fair. I can't be expected to live this way today. He doesn't have to do those things. Her parents don't make her live this way. But we continue and we instruct because why? We want to take fun away from them? No, we love them. We love them. Earthly parents will always say, we we want children who are healthy and happy. We say that. We hear that all the time. Well, here's the deal. Don't you know that you have a heavenly father? You have a heavenly father. And yes, he has a desired way in which he wants you to live this life, but he's not trying to take any good thing from you. He loves you. And he wants something so much more for you than just health and happiness. He wants your holiness. He wants you to be set apart from this world. And he wants your joy to be full. That is the reason why he says in his word, John says as he writes this letter back in, back in verse 4, 1 John 1, 4, he says, we're writing these things. 
We're writing these things, you know, we're, we're saying these things, we're giving you these, these challenges, you know, we're, all the instruction, all the, all the, all the, the things that are going to make you feel convicted from this and in this series. In 1 John 1, 4, he says, we are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. All these things that are going to prove difficult for us in this series and in this book, these things are for your joy. But they seem restrictive and inconvenient to some of us. So what do we do? We live for God on Sunday or Saturday night. And we live for the world and for the things of this world on Monday. There's a name for that. You already know what it is. And to these people, to us, John says this, verse 5 through 7. He says, this is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. We are not practicing the truth. But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. In other words, People who love the things of this world, they actually walk and they live in darkness. But people who really know God, they live in the light. And church, I want to say something that is very, very obvious, a very obvious statement. Light and darkness are not the same thing. You knew that already, right? Right? Light and darkness, not the same thing, completely different in every way. So, you say that you believe in God. Does your life look any different from everybody else? And church attendance is not enough. It would be easy right now to be like, well, I'm here. He's not. She's not. This is good. This is good. We're supposed to do this. This is good and a good step, but it's not enough. You should be able to look at every area of my life, the way I raise my kids, the way I speak to my wife, the way I handle my finances, the way I work my job, the way I'm involved in my community. You should be able to look at every area of my life and go, that guy doesn't live like everybody else lives. He's different. And you know what? I should be able to look at you and say the same thing about every area of your life. John goes a little bit further as we we go to chapter 2. We'll read just a couple of verses in chapter 2. In 1 John 2, verse 15, he says, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. And, And there it is right there. Do not love the things of this world. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. So, if you believe in God, but you love the things of this world, you may be a Christian atheist. He goes further, verse 16 through 17. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These, these things, these cravings, they are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. There's that word again. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So, if you believe in God, but you continue to crave and consume the things of this world, you may be a Christian atheist. And uh, John gets really specific here, and he talks about three cravings. He talks about three cravings that that we are susceptible to, three cravings that we get mixed up in, even as so-called believers. And the first craving of this world that he talks about, he says, is a craving for physical pleasure. And we know what that is. I don't have to paint a picture. I'm not going to paint a picture or anything like that. We know what this is. And for some of us, we might hear that and go, oh, there it is, just the Bible saying, that's bad, 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 all that stuff. Listen, that's not what John is saying. Physical pleasure is not a bad thing. It's a gift. 
It is a gift that God actually gave to us to be entered into and to be enjoyed under the umbrella, the heading of, the context of, the safety of, the blessing of marriage. Come on, you knew I was going to say that, right? You've been here long enough. You know the way it goes, right? I know nobody lives that way. I know nobody thinks that way. But you are in a really cool, really modern, old school church right now. And we believe the word of God. This is something that is supposed to be enjoyed in the context of marriage. And when it is, it's good and it's right. The problem is, you and I, we still try to meet the right needs the wrong way. And every time we do, the world just applauds and says, good for you. Do what you want. You're in charge. We have this craving for physical pleasure, but there's two other cravings he talked about as well. He said that there was also a craving for everything we see. In other words, we have this never-ending hunger for more. We want more house. We want more cars, we want more money and more paycheck and more vacations and more toys. If you stopped and thought about it for a second, you would realize God has actually already given you kind of everything. You have it all. You don't want, you don't lack for anything, but still, it's just, it's not enough. We want more. I, I think about that, that song in that, that movie, Greatest Showman, with uh, it's Hugh Jackman, right? I think it's Hugh, Hugh Jackman. Um, and my kids love that movie. I've seen it far too many times, but if you've seen that movie, there's this song with a singer on a stage, and she sings what? Never enough, right? Never enough, never, never for me, for me. Does that sound familiar to anyone? We have a craving for everything we see, and for me, it's never enough. And, and then he, he gives one, one more craving. He says that we have a craving for our achievements and our possessions. It's about our stuff and my name. It's funny, too, because here at Central, we, we sing a, a song, and it's one of the, my favorite songs that we sing. It's called More Like Jesus. Anybody like that one? That's a good song, you know, and in that song, it says, if more of you means less of me, take everything. And you sound so good when you sing that song. But then, then we walk out of the doors, the church buildings, and we sing a different tune, don't we? You know, we, we, we claim to believe in God, but we live for and love the things of this world. We know it's wrong. That's why it's so quiet in both of these places right now. We know it's wrong, but the craving is just so strong. So the question really becomes, how can we change? The question becomes, how can we start actually craving the things of God instead of, instead of and over the things of this world? And so for the last few minutes, let's just, let's spend some time here. Let's spend some time talking about this. Let's talk about changing our cravings. Say, so how do we do that? How do I start to crave the things of God instead of the things of this world? How do I change my cravings? Well, it all begins when we start to understand this, this one very simple truth. You crave whatever you consume. I know that's really simple, but... If you get this, you start to understand, and it's helpful, and it's powerful. You crave whatever it is that you have been consuming. Let me give you an example. I believe in healthy eating. I believe, you know, that when I exercise and stay in shape and eat healthy, it gives me the energy, the strength, the health to do the things that God wants me to do, and this body is something that God has given to me for a short time, and I want to steward it well to do what God has called me to do. I believe in healthy eating. I just said that two or three times. But what if I made that claim to you, hey, I, I believe in healthy eating, but then I lived my life every single day eating McDonald's food. It would not take long before you saw me pulling something out of that bag or pulling my car into the drive-thru before you went, that dude doesn't practice what he preaches, right? 
I mean, he says one thing, but then his life, his actions do not line up with his words, his claim. Well, you probably could guess this. I don't eat much McDonald's. But there is a member of our staff that eats far too much McDonald's. And um, I don't want to make him feel bad. I, I don't want to call him out by name or anything like that. But we do have a picture um, that we'll put on the, the screens. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, this is, uh, if, you, if you're new, this is Adam Lavertier. He is our, our worship director, and the dude eats McDonald's all the time. And every time, we're in our conference room there, every time, this is like a typical scene, I'm like, dude, you can't eat that stuff, okay? That's not good for you. It's not healthy. Like, I know you're skinny now, but you're like 20. It's going to change, all right? <laughs> and listen, if you can't fit into your skinny jeans one day because of all the McDonald's, I'm going to have to fire you because it goes along with your position, okay? I tell them all the time, you can't, you can't eat that stuff. You know, if you really believe in healthy eating, you can't consume that stuff anymore. But Adam would probably respond and he would probably say to that, but I like it so much, I crave it so much. And I would answer him, and I would, I would say, this stopped being a sermon like two minutes ago. It became an intervention for Adam, by the way. But <laughs> Adam, wherever you are, I hope you're taking notes. But Adam might say, I, I crave it so much. And I would say, of course you crave it because you crave whatever you consume. You know, we, we call ourselves Christians, believers. Probably most people watching this message in our rooms right now would say, I believe in God. Well, if you do, it's time to consume something different. It's time to change the diet up and consume something greater and better and new. This is what Jesus said when he was here on this earth. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. Sometimes we think all that we see, all that it is, is physical. If I got bread, I'm good. No, no, no. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, so here's a question. Are you consuming the word of God diligently and daily? Do you read the Bible outside of just a weekend service? And I don't mean just to, because I've been there, check it off, and you know, I read a page, I read a chapter, whatever it is. I mean getting into the word of God daily, knowing God has a message for me here, and I want to receive it, I want to get it, I want to put it in my mind and on my heart, I want to meditate on it throughout the day, and I want to live this out. Whatever he has for me in here, I want to live this out to the best of my ability today. Are we consuming the word of God? Because here's the thing. It may be possible for you to believe in God without consuming the word, but it is absolutely impossible for you to be a follower of Jesus without learning and living the word. And I, yeah, woo, exactly, exactly. And I know, I know some people might say, you know, but Dan, I don't, it's difficult. I don't know where to start. I'm new in, in, in all of this and you know, and in and, and my schedule, Dan, you only work on Sundays, a little bit on Saturdays, you know, so you wouldn't know, but my, my schedule's busy, and, you know, I, I was hoping more would laugh at that, knowing it was a joke, but <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> and it might, yeah, it might actually mean that you've got to go talk to somebody who's been doing this longer than you and say, can you help me get started? It might mean that you need to take a Bible home with you today. It might mean that you need to download an app on your phone and start a Bible reading program or, or something like that. But I am promising you, if you start to actually get into the Word of God, consuming His Word, and you do it for a few weeks and then a few months, all of a sudden, go ahead and try to stop after doing that. You know what you're going to notice? You know what you're going to feel? A craving for something different and new, for the right things, for the Word of God. You know, we say that we believe in God. Well, it's time for a new diet. It's time to consume something different and new. And let me, let me just give you one, one helpful tip in all of this. Don't try to do this on your own. The reason why when people say, I'm going to get serious about my physical health, the reason why those people go out and get a, a personal trainer or join a group exercise class or Jenny Craig or something like, is Jenny Craig still a thing? Is Jenny still with us? I don't know, but... The reason why people go and they do those things is because all of this just becomes better, easier, even more enjoyable and fun in the context of community. 
well, we, we don't have Jenny Craig here at, at Central Church, but, but what we do have is community groups. You know, other people who say, I'm not perfect, or I'm not perfect, but man, let's get together and let's try to live the way we're supposed to live. Let's live like we actually believe what we say we believe. And it's not people in rows listening to one dude. This is good too, but it's people in circles, in a living room, around a coffee table, opening up the word of God, consuming it together, talking about it together, applying it to your lives, praying for one another, keeping each other accountable and caring for each other throughout the week. This is a step of faith that some of us need to take this fall. We're starting new groups. We want you in. You should get into a community group. Because for some of us, we've been saying for a long, long time, we've been making all these claims, I believe in God, I believe in God. Well, if you really do, it's time for some changes and for some steps of faith. You know, John has so much more that he wants to say to us, that he's going to say to us uh, in, this, in this letter. Uh, but let's, let's finish by just finishing out the last couple of verses in chapter 1, and that's verse 8 through 9. John says here, he says, If we claim we have no sin, in other words, if you're acting like none of this applies to you, but to the person next to you, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. And if we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. In other words... Church, it is time for a checkup. It is time to get on the scale, so to speak, and see where we are at. Because you may claim to believe in God, but are you living like you don't? Are you a Christian atheist? And isn't it time that our lives matched our beliefs? Both of our locations, would you pray with me right now? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Church, I love you guys. It is great to to be together and to challenge each other and to be in a place where we can have challenge and we can have conviction and we can talk about the hard things because when it comes right down to it, what we need is not more of Dan's words. We need more of the word of God in our lives, not just to take it in and hear it. We need to live it. So God, I pray for for everyone here right now, for every person in this church family, Lord, that we would hear these things, that I don't think there's any person that could have gone through this this time without going, well, that's something I need to change, or yeah, I'm not doing that the way I should, or yeah, there's some work over there, that we would take those things and not just dismiss them when we walk through the doors, that we wouldn't be people who live for you on the weekend and live for the world and the things of this world and crave and consume and love it every other day. God, we don't want to just talk a good game. We don't want to be like the people Paul was talking to Titus about who were just filled with meaningless talk. We want to live this. We want to mean this. It's not easy. It'd be much easier to go with the current and live for the things of this world. We know that. You know that. But we believe that living your word, following your son Jesus, his teachings, even when it's difficult, is going to lead to life and eternal life. Why would we aim for anything else? But God, we need your strength and we need your help. So take these things. I pray that you would place them on our hearts even throughout the week. And we would come back even next week excited and ready to learn and grow some more together. Thank you, God, that when we confess our sins to you, you are faithful and you are just and you forgive us of those things. Forgive us now, we pray. We love you. Lord, I pray that this week we would go out and we would live what we claim to believe. Asking all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.